A person suffering from diabetes mellitus is unable to produce enough of the protein insulin to regulate their blood sugar levels. This condition can be fatal. Until 1982, diabetic patients were administered animal insulin, harvested from the pancreases of cows and pigs. While this method was largely safe and effective, there were some patients who suffered allergic reactions to the animal insulin. The nascent field of genetic engineering found its first major success in using bacteria to produce human insulin. Scientists found that they could transform E. coli bacterial cells into insulin factories by placing human DNA inside their cell walls. DNA is not only found in chromosomes. Many types of cells also carry shorter strands of DNA outside their chromosomes in circular chains called plasmids. Plasmids generally contain from 1,000 to 100,000 base pairs, far fewer than the several million often found in chromosomal DNA. A major breakthrough in biotechnology was made when scientists found they could insert the human gene for insulin production into a plasmid, and then insert that plasmid into an E. coli cell. The cell started producing the insulin protein, as did its offspring, and the offspring of its offspring. As the colony grew exponentially, so did insulin production. This method is so effective that, in the space of 20 years, it has almost completely replaced animal insulin as a treatment for diabetes. This experiment will demonstrate the existence of plasmid DNA in E. coli cells. To isolate the plasmids, the other parts of the cell must first be broken down. Obtain a microcentrifuge tube of suspended E. coli cells. Pipette some cell lysis solution into the tube, cap it, and gently mix it by inverting it. The cell lysis solution contains sodium hydroxide, which will break down the proteins, RNA, and some DNA. The solution also contains a detergent called sodium dodecyl sulfate, or SDS. SDS dissolves the cell membrane and denatures proteins. Plasmids are circular chains, but are normally found in a supercoiled state, like a rubber band that's been twisted until it coils itself into a little ball. Because supercoiled DNA is so tightly twisted, the alkaline solution won't break it down. Keep the solution on ice for five minutes. Add potassium acetate neutralization buffer using a pipette. The acid will neutralize the basic sodium hydroxide, and the cold will cause potassium salt to precipitate, removing the SDS from the solution. Cap the tube again and mix it thoroughly. You should see a white precipitate form. This precipitate is made up of SDS, cell membrane fragments, proteins, and large amounts of chromosomal DNA, which is attached to the membrane fragments. Ice the tube for four more minutes. Place the tube in a microcentrifuge and run it at full speed for five minutes to facilitate the precipitation of unwanted fragments. When it's done, a pellet of unwanted fragments should have formed at the bottom of the tube. Pipette 0.5 milliliters of the supernatant into a fresh tube. This will contain plasmid DNA. Add ice-cold ethanol or isopropanol Mix thoroughly and place it on ice for five minutes. The plasmid will now start to precipitate. Centrifuge this tube at full speed for 10 minutes to form a pellet of plasmid in the lower part of the tube. Carefully remove the supernatant with a transfer pipette without touching the sides of the tube. Leave the tube open and allow the pellet to air dry for approximately 10 minutes. Suspend the pellet in RNA solution, which will further degrade any residual RNA in the sample. Cap the tube and mix it by vortexing. Briefly centrifuge the tube again to get its contents to the bottom. Incubate it at 37 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes to allow the RNAs to work. The sample now contains plasmid DNA, degraded RNA, and some residual chromosomal DNA. To separate these elements further, a process called electrophoresis is required. 
Agarose gel electrophoresis is a common method of analyzing samples of plasma DNA. A tray of agarose gel is prepared with DNA samples placed in wells along one side. DNA molecules have a strong negative charge, so if an electric field is applied to the tray, they will move towards the positive electrode. Agarose gels have microscopic pores, which act as a filter when molecules attempt to move through them. Smaller molecules will move through the gel more quickly than larger molecules. Therefore, if the electric field is applied for a given amount of time, the molecules will arrange themselves by size on the tray. Those closest to the positive electrode are the smallest, and those farthest away are the largest. To prepare the gel, combine buffer, water, and agarose powder in a flask. Swirl to disperse the clumps. Boil the mixture to dissolve the powder, stirring occasionally. It should become clear like water. Cool the solution to 55 degrees and add distilled water to compensate for any evaporation that may have occurred. To prepare the gel bed, first close off the open ends using rubber dams. Make sure that the bed is clean and dry. Place a well former template, known as a comb, in the first set of notches nearest the end of the gel bed. Make sure it's on a level surface and pour the auger solution into it. Allow 20 minutes for it to solidify. It will be firm and cool to the touch. Once the gel is solidified, carefully and slowly remove the rubber dams and comb. Place the gel bed into the electrophoresis chamber, centered and level on the platform. Fill the chamber with diluted buffer. This type of gel is often called a submarine gel because it's submerged under a buffer. Before loading the sample, it should be heated to 65 degrees to break down unwanted aggregates. To prepare the sample for placement in the gel, mix it with 5 microliters of gel loading solution. Then load it into a sample well, taking care not to tear the gel. Snap down the covers of the positive and negative electrode terminals and make sure they're properly oriented. Connect them to the power source and run the electrophoresis for a time specified by your instructor. Bubbles should form on the electrodes if the current is flowing. Allow the tracking die to migrate at least 4 centimeters to allow the DNA bands to separate. Once the electrophoresis is done, turn off the power, unplug the electrodes, and remove the cover. To make the isolation more apparent, stain the gel for transillumination. When it's ready, take it to a transilluminator to view the bands. When struck with the ultraviolet light of the transilluminator, the dye in the samples will luminesce. A band of plasmid molecules should appear having traveled partway through the gel. It should align with the latter according to the size of the particles, approximately 2,665 base pairs. The technology that allows us to manipulate plasmid DNA and the ability of some cells to accept foreign plasmids has reshaped modern biological science. These versatile, malleable molecules are central to genetic research and engineering and will no doubt be the source of many discoveries and innovations to come.